Good morning and welcome. My name is Sharon Welch and I'll be your moderator for this morning's class. Welcome to the Ithaca class. This is a school and not a church. Neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. The school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school is a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in 1958. <clears throat> uh, the Ithaca branch was established in 1979. We have whole classes throughout the United States, Canada, and other certain foreign countries. <clears throat> the Dean of uh, uh, Ithaca Branch is Dr. Robert White, and our host is Dr. Greg Preston. Now in this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been substituted by Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been translated to God. And the, and the true name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been translated to reach Jesus. Now, Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, states in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and that there are God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that is the title that the Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but it's erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in our English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Like in such names as Jesus and Jehovah, improper renderings of the true name of the Father and His Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. <clears throat> now Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state He is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose the cloud to symbolize himself because the cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have this cloud painted all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on the chart abides within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man cannot perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and form right within himself, known as Yahweh Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being that is the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine vision and understood in divine revelation. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane known as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world erroneously calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question we must ask ourselves is what was the name of the Messiah at the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title can be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by a divine pattern of the universe. It's called a divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai 
and he showed him this tabernacle pattern in a vision. He instructed Moses to build one <clears throat> exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This tabernacle pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments making up the one tabernacle pattern. We also go about in the school to show proof how that everything in the universe is made and operated according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the school has 10 primary constitutional aims and objectives and they are as follows. <clears throat> First is to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah <clears throat> without the distinction of race, <clears throat> excuse me, and nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scripture, comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, modern, critical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensation and ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensation of time. Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered in the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known <clears throat> that Yahweh from the beginning ordained. There is no other name given among men whereby men can be saved, saving the name Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah, with a hope of immortal glorification and the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is speak the truth. At this time, we'd like to have the class dedicated in prayer by Dr. Carolyn Russell. And that'll be followed by a scripture, which is Revelations, the first chapter. We'd like to have that read by Dr. Scott Miller. And uh, our scripture readers this morning will be Dr. Scott Miller and Dr. Reva Sahar. Dr. Russell. Good morning. May we all bow our hearts and mind for a moment of prayer and calm. Heavenly Father Yahweh, we thank you for all the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. And thank you is never enough. Gracious, we are thankful for the knowledge the wisdom, and for you manifesting in a physical body and giving us this great teaching. We ask that you continue to give us peace, understanding, wisdom, and all of your... Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, good evening. Um, Morning. Today's scripture will be read, or good morning. <laughs> Still not used to these morning classes. Uh, today's scripture will be read out of the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old New Testaments, critically, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by A.B. Traina of the Scripture Research Association. And I guess it's my understanding that Revelation, the first chapter in the Holy Name Bible, is a little different. I will be reading out of the King James normally. So if there's a little difference, I apologize. Mm -hmm. um, so Revelation, the first chapter, the revelation of Yahshua, the Messiah, which Yahweh gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John, who bore record of the word of Yahweh and of the testimony of Yahshua, the Messiah, and all of the things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the ending, saith Yahweh Elohim, 
which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. John, to the seven assemblies which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Yahshua the Messiah, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto Yahweh his Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierce him. All the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Yes, so be it. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Yahshua the Messiah, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of Yahweh and for the testimony of Yahshua the Messiah. I was in the spirit on the Sabbath day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, What thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven assemblies which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks was like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white, white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of the two and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and have the keys of Sheol and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the messengers of the seven assemblies, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven assemblies. That's Revelation, the first chapter. Thank you, Dr. Carolyn Russell and Dr. Scott Miller. And at this time, we call on our first speaker, which will be our host, Dr. Gregory Prestis. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. yes. My voice is not tinny? No. Okay, I'll try to stay calm. My <laughs> microphone doesn't like it when I get excited and talk loudly. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to um, share some of the things that we've come to appreciate uh, in this teaching uh, concerning the purpose of our Heavenly Father, Yahweh. Um, Revelation, uh, Dr. Kenley makes a statement somewhere that it's really the simplest book in the Bible because it's just telling you uh, what the Bible is all about, what the purpose of Yahweh is all about. And in this class, we have an understanding of Revelation that um, is not, not common in, in the world. So I just want to start with that. Now, there was a couple things um, that I was talking to Bob about, and at one point he said, um, would you be willing to share that in the class? So that's why I'm here. And... Um, I just ask that, that there's a lot of material I'd like to try to lay out. And our goal in this class is to come to an understanding um, of Yahweh and his purpose. If we go back to the aims for a second, um, it, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. And Yahweh has to make that possible, and he's done that by uh, giving us countless examples and overturning and overturning and overturning 
uh, the operation of his purpose through specific um, what we call ages and dispensations. Now, it's impossible to understand the purpose of Yahweh without um, coming to an understanding of the mystery of iniquity. So we see in the seventh aim, it's to discern and avoid being deceived by the Lucifer, uh, by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. And that's something that we're going to come back to. Um, so let's, let's jump into uh, Revelation, the first chapter. And um, Holy Name Bible is, is great, and it's got some things that um, we need. But um, like Scott said, uh, I mean, I'm more familiar with it in, in the King James. So if you have it in the King James, if we could just read it out of there, um, because I'm looking at an electronic version, and I don't have an electronic version of um, Holy Name Bible. So can somebody just start reading? Um, sure, yeah. Revelation. Revelation. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Whoever. Someone. Okay. Uh, Revelation <laughs> 1 and 1, the, uh, out of the King James. The revelation of Yahshua the Messiah, which Yahweh gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Okay. Now, um, not, you know, they, they, to try to get through sort of an overview of Yahweh's purpose from start to finish. We're just not going to be able to touch on a lot of the details. And we're all pretty much aware of these things. And, um, but I do want to, uh, you know, just sort of explain things as we go along. So the revelation of Yahshua which Yahweh gave unto him. Now, the moderation has already covered the fact that Yahweh is spirit. And in that state, in that condition, um, he's the all in all. Everything uh, that exists, exists of him and within him. And yet in that state, we, we wouldn't know anything about him. So Yahweh takes on this intermediate shape and form that he refers to himself as Elohim, or this is Yahweh in an intermediate shape and form, and he's referred to in the scriptures as Yahweh Elohim. And we've come to understand that this is the real Yahshua. This is the Yahshua is the name of Yahweh in this superincorporeal form. And so the revelation of Yahshua comes from Yahweh. Now, uh, John here is writing, and as Dr. Kinley portrays on this chart, Moses and John are seeing um, vision of the same thing. They're seeing Yahweh Elohim. Now Moses is seeing um, as it were, he's looking down from the beginning towards the ending. And you see this vision of the seven days of creation that he had. John is seeing the same Yahweh Elohim, the same Yahshua. And he's seeing the same vision. But John is over here and he's looking at it from uh, the ending back towards the beginning. And... Many times, Dr. Kinley states that he saw the same vision that Moses saw, and he saw the same vision that John saw, and it's just one vision. It's the vision of Elohim. It's the revelation of Yahshua. Okay, uh, read on verse 2, please. Verse 2, who bear record of the word of Yahweh? and of the testimony of Yahshua the Messiah, and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, 
and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now, um, this was actually written, I think the Bible chronology lists this as 96 AD. But um, one of the things we come to understand with the operation of Yahweh's purpose and with um, it's represented here on the ages and dispensations chart is that those um, six days of creation are reflected in approximately 6,000 years of time. And you have it in, um, it's in Peter and it's in the Psalms, how a day with Yahweh is as a thousand years. And so we find out that um, there's a creative age and this age uh, takes place not in the realm of time, but in the realm of eternity. And so in Yahweh's purpose, we don't start counting time until uh, the transgression and until Adam is cast out of the garden. And then that begins uh, the operation of Yahweh's purpose in time. And so we have three ages uh, covering those 6,000 years approximately of time. Now, uh, in Adam, all men died. So, um, and it's not until Yahshua that there is a resurrection. But what we need to understand is that the resurrection, we are, uh, as Paul writes, we have this treasure in earthen vessels now. And we now are here at the close of this present uh, kingdom age. And John and Paul and all the apostles are writing and operating at the beginning of this present kingdom age. So this age, in a sense, it's a, it's a hybrid age in that we have a spiritual revelation and we have spiritual vision and we have a spiritual understanding that's given to us by the Holy Spirit. And yet we still, we have that treasure, we have that understanding, we have that revelation in earthen vessels. So um, the entire world counts it as uh, 2021 today. And so chronologically, we are well, we are pushing up against the edge of this present kingdom age. But psychologically and spiritually, if you haven't had... Um, a revelation of the spirit, if you haven't seen through the veil of the flesh, then um, you're still operating in the nighttime of Yahweh's purpose uh, with, with carnal ordinances and so on and so forth. So um, <clears throat> these are things that we just uh, want to come to an understanding of, and it's some of these things that I'm, I'm uh, hoping Yahshua willing uh, to work with today. And again, it's, these are all things that we're well familiar with. Um, but I do want to say that um, anyone who listens to MP4s and uh, the lectures and the things that are being taught uh, that come to us from the West, um, there are a lot of things said and a lot of statements made. And um, one of the fundamental principles of this teaching uh, is Isaiah 8 and 20, which states um, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So even in this spiritual age or the present kingdom age of grace, talking about um, the revelation of Yahshua, um, that still is witnessed by the law, by the things that are contained in the law and, and in the prophets. And if, if you think about it, when we talk about the law, that's the first five books of Moses. And that was delivered to us here in this fourth dispensation uh, through Moses, but it came from Yahweh and it came from Yahweh through Moses. And so Moses, well, uh, Yahweh was in full control, and it was Yahweh operating through Moses. Therefore, we don't worship Moses. Um, we worship Yahweh. But through Moses, he gave us what's called the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, and that presents uh, 
that contains a representation of Yahweh's purpose. And it's within the writings of Moses that we find the book of Genesis, and it's in the book of Genesis that we learn about Abraham and the Melchizedek priesthood and the Abrahamic promise and uh, Abraham uh, having a son, Isaac, by his beloved wife, Sarah, and the fact that Abraham's seed and the promise to Abraham's seed was called through Isaac. It's in um, Moses' writings of Genesis that we find out about Noah and what's going on um, at the end of that age. And it's in the writings of Moses that we find out about what's going on with Adam and Eve. And um, th there's a lot here, and I'm, I'm trying to just go uh, slowly, and we're going to go over these things several times. But what we're trying to do is come right now, today, come to an overall appreciation of the operation of Yahweh's purpose down through the ages and through the dispensations. And specifically, um, as it says in, in one of those aims, uh, here, let me get it just so we can stay grounded. Um, in the sixth aim, learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and the ages and ages. And then uh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, or dragon, or Satan and his demons, operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. And there's a particularity there uh, that I'm hoping we can elaborate on a little bit today and come to an understanding of. So, uh, you know, time goes so fast, it's already 1130. Um, but uh, last, I think recently, it might have been the week before last, uh, we had um, one of the speakers spoke about this ages and dispensations chart. And she mentioned that um, the way these letters uh, are laid out has changed. And this is actually, this is something, the things I'm trying to share today is something that I've been chewing on for quite a while. I have discussed it with, with, with folks, but it was that um, comment about the dispensations that sort of brought this back to mind and uh, resulted in uh, me talking to Bob and me being here today trying to explain it. Now, um, at first I was thinking that I would go in and, you know, if you go to the original, uh, if you go to the textbook, <clears throat> uh, and the, this is the older versions, they, this has been changed in the most recent version. Let me see if I can bring it up. Um, this is what the ages and dispensations chart essentially looks like in the textbook prior to the uh, electronic version that was distributed. And this is what it looks like essentially in the first textbook, which was published in 61. And all the writing and everything here, it's hard to see, but I just, and we can go to the chart that we have that, that is essentially the same. But what I want to point out is we have these dispensations. And um, the way these dispensations are laid out, and actually the names of these dispensations has changed um, between uh, when the textbook was put out and the charts that we use now. And um, if you notice, uh, for this whole entire age, originally it just had the, the fifth dispensation, the dispensation of grace. And this is the present kingdom age of grace. And so we grace is operating through this entire present age. And um, here it's referred to as the fifth dispensation or the law of the spirit. Now, the sixth dispensation was placed in the, the age that's coming up, which is the age of immortality. And then they have a, they had a seventh dispensation placed over here in the ages to come. Now, if you look at the chart that we use, uh, what, 
And, and this is the chart that's in the electronic version of the textbook that was released by the Institute when they decided to stop publishing uh, text, uh, publishing of physical books. And you'll see that the arrangement of the dispensations has changed. The six dispensations brought into this present age and uh, they have the seventh dispensation here in, um, in the next age or the age of immortality. And it turns out that the word dispensation, these are not clearly labeled in the scriptures this way. You will find Adam and Noah and Melchizedek and Abraham and everything, but they're not specifically called out dispensations. If you look this up in the world, the way the Christian world thinks about the dispensations, and, and also in the 61 textbook, there's mention of an Edenic dispensation. Now, uh, I'm bringing this up briefly, and we'll come back to this, to just, it, when we want to understand the operation of the mystery of iniquity, it said specifically the dispensations of time. Because it's the operation of the mystery of iniquity, the Edenic dispensation took place in the realm of eternity. And it was uh, Satan's, uh, influence and deception of Eve that caused Adam to transgress by because of his love for his bride, which Yahweh then cast them out of the garden and began, um, we began counting time. Now, um, There's no, see the creative age, and Doc's very clear about this, the creation took place in the realm of eternity. So the creative, the Edenic dispensation is not a dispensation of time. Now, coming all the way over to here, uh, we have the seventh dispensation showing forth in the kingdom age, which again is, is we're back into eternity, um, a big out of time. So there, and, and then the age of grace is actually a spiritual dispensation. The dispensation of grace is a spiritual dispensation that's been operating now for these 2000 years. So um, I just wanna bear that in mind that the definition of these dispensations is, requires understanding and it requires a revelation and it has um, evolved or uh, changed a little um, over time. And then here we have the standard chart which, which we use most often. Now we'll, we're gonna go over all that again, Yahshua willing. Uh, now, where were you in the scripture? Um, we ended at verse four. Okay. Um, read verse four again for me, please. Okay. Revelation one and four. John, to the seven assemblies which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. Okay. So again, if we... Um, Sorry for jumping around here, but I'm trying to keep up with something that we can look at visually. Um, here is Yahshua appearing to John, and it says, from him which is, which was, and which is to come. So the book of Revelation, and this is reiterated uh, in verse 19, which, which hopefully we'll get to, where he says to John, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. So the book of Revelation um, is not a linear book and this, this revelation covers what we would call the past, the present and the future. Um, and if, if we take John's point of reference, then he's there um, in 96 AD. Everything prior to that is the past or that which was. You've got that which is what was going on there in John's time. 
And then you've got that which is to come, which is for us the past, but for John, it was everything from 96 AD down to the present. And uh, go ahead. And from the seven spirits, which are before his throne. Now, we're going to come back to that. But, see, we always want to use the pattern to understand. I mean, and, and that's not what we want. That's how Yahweh has purpose. He's operating his purpose according to this pattern. And there's no one single way. I mean, if you apply the pattern to an atom, you can apply the pattern to a cell. You can apply the pattern to... Uh, the human body. You can apply the pattern to uh, an event. See, if we go to, um, well, the elementary chart or the 40 plate chart, um, you have 40 plates that Dr. Kenley designed and, and uh, worked with RP to have painted. And each one of these shows forth this threefold uh, representation. So each one of these shows forth the operation of Yahweh's pattern. And yet, um, there's only uh, one purpose, and there's only one uh, pattern, as it were. <laughs> and so, uh, we apply the pattern to a myriad of things, but overall, what we're trying to come to an understanding of is the operation of Yahweh's purpose, and he's operating according to the pattern. Now, um, when he says, re read that again about the seven spirits, please. Um, and from the seven spirits, which are before his throne. Okay. Now, uh, oh, seven spirits before his throne. See, there's so many things. A lot of people consider revelation to be just like a, a fantasy. And to think that it has no concrete meaning. But if we, um, so I would say in order to understand this, we need to wanna to find these seven spirits operating um, in the pattern. Now we know, uh, I'll try to use this one so we don't jump around quite so much, but the Ark of the Covenant represented a throne. And um, you had the two angels bearing witness to the presence of Yahweh. And on the Day of Atonement, Yahweh Elohim or Yahshua would appear to that priest. Uh, it's called, referred to as the flash of the Shekinah. And it's signaled that the atonement had been accomplished on that priest's third trip up here. And you can see him dressed here in, in the garments of beauty and glory. And all of these things have meaning. Now, uh, there was a veil that separated the most holy place from the holy place, and this veil was present all the way through uh, the operation of Yahweh's purpose until the resurrection, ascension, and outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now, if you were to take this veil out and you were um, take, looking at the viewpoint from the throne, you would see this lampstand and this lampstand had only seven branches. And you would see each branch being a flame. Now, uh, jump down just, just to give you a, a sense. Um, to uh, Hold where you are, Scott, please. And remember, because I don't remember, I won't remember the exact okay. verse. But jump down to verse 20. Okay. Uh, Revelation 1 and 20. The mystery of the seven stars. Now, we talk about, um, and again, they, we don't talk about these things. These are the things that Dr. Kenley taught us repeatedly. They're documented in the textbook. Uh, we have lectures and transcripts where he discusses these things, and they're witnessed to in the scriptures. Uh, there is a mystery of righteousness and a mystery of iniquity, and we read about those in the Ames, and we'll be coming back to that. But um, there are other mysteries. Uh, the entire purpose of Yahweh is hidden in a mystery. So those are two uh, fundamental mysteries, but there are many things that are, are not fully understood in the purpose of Yahweh and in the book of Revelation. And specifically, we have uh, the mystery of the seven stars. So 
um, we find, and I'll use this picture, there are better pictures, but um, here's a, a close up picture of uh, what John is seeing. Uh, and you can see the seven stars depicted in his right hand, um, the way it's, it's about to be described here. So this is a mystery. And um, we're talking about the seven spirits that are before his throne. And we're likening these seven spirits to these seven flames. And we find out that he makes his, his angels ministers uh, uh, and his uh, spirits. He makes his angel spirits and his ministers flames of fire. Uh, Paul talks about that, and we, we can get that scripture. But in order to help us understand what John is seeing, and in order to help us understand the purpose of Yahweh, see, always we want to bear in mind this tabernacle pattern. And so you can see this lampstand with these seven flames um, as representing, in a sense, these seven spirits. And you see there uh, before the throne of Yahweh. Um, uh, once this veil is removed, you would, you would see them. So this veil represents many things, and I, I just can't get off into that right now. But uh, we, we, it's in the scriptures, and we understand that this veil is removed in uh, Yahshua. And so beginning with the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Yahshua being the intercessor, he's allowing us to see into the most holy place. And he's, he's giving us a comprehension of Yahweh's spirit and Yahweh's purpose. And he's making this atonement. That is the process of atonement. It's his putting his spirit of faith and of hope and of love, of, of wisdom, intelligence, knowledge, love, beauty, justice, foundation, power, and strength in our hearts and minds. And it's that spirit that is the go-between. And it's that spirit that allows us to understand the things of Yahweh and his purpose. So uh, I hope you can see that the one way to look at this lampstand is uh, showing you these uh, seven flames representing the seven spirits, or uh, we're going to find out here the seven angels. So go ahead. I'm sorry, verse 20 again. Okay, Revelation 1 and 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven assemblies. And the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven assemblies. Now, um, there's the seven candlesticks or lampstands. And there were only seven branches. <clears throat> and when <clears throat> we read in Revelation, it talks about <clears throat> seven angels and seven churches. And we know that seven um, is an important number in Yahweh's purpose. And just as with the days of creation, you had those seven days of creation uh, that Moses saw. Now, <clears throat> I want to uh, change tax for a, bit, a, bit, uh, a minute. And there are a couple of statements uh, that yeah, Dr. Kinley has made over the years. And for many of us, who've been in class a long time and who are reading these transcripts and listening to his lectures and especially these new lectures that have come out, it's, um, it's stimulated uh, a lot of interest. Dr. Kelly uh, taught quite a bit and he said some amazing things. And sometimes you can just read one sentence that he says and it can change the way you think about something and lead to uh, an improved or a more comprehensive uh, understanding of, of, of Yahweh and his purpose. Now, um, I, because of the time, and even though it might seem like we have a lot of time, um, time goes fast. Uh, I want to uh, just pick up on um, two transcripts of Dr. Kenley, and I just want to read uh, a brief excerpt 
And so uh, because to go get the transcript and have it all read in context, it, it would just it would just um, take too much time. I'm sorry. But we, I, I have, you know, we can afterwards, anyone who has questions. In fact, I meant to say, if you have questions while we go through this, which we encourage questions at all times, just try, just write them down and don't be distracted by them. Please just try to stay with me. And then um, we can talk about it after class or Bob has said we can always uh, address questions uh, in future classes and it doesn't necessarily have to be me who addresses those questions. Now, this is from the transcript, you have to die to go to heaven. It was spoken in 1966. Um, the lecture that Dr. Kinley gave, and this is from pages two and three. And I've excerpted some stuff out uh, to try to just get down to the focus of it. And um, you're encouraged to read these transcripts on your own. Now, uh, since I have it up here, uh, could somebody, um, can you see this well enough to read it or do I need to read it? I can read it. Thank you. And now when I saw and understood in the vision that I received, then it was contrary to what I had in my mind. Now pause, Dr. Kinley was a preacher, assistant pastor in the Church of God for 15 years prior to his vision. And he baptized folks, conducted healing service, preached water baptism, and did everything the way the ministers are still doing it today. But see, he says he realized that once he saw the vision, it was contrary to what he had in mind. Go ahead. So then I had to go on back and I had to show you that I saw the self same vision that Moses saw. Now, I tried my best to tell these folks what my mission was, and I don't think I have done a good job. So, so I'll try one more time. So you see that Moses chart, <clears throat> and I'm not going to flip back and forth right now, um, with Moses on one side and John on the other, on the Isle of Patmos, seeing this vision and revelation of Yahshua. Um, that's a representation of the vision that Moses saw. There's only one vision, and that vision takes place in eternity. And Dr. Kenley writes in his vision pamphlet how he was transported into the realm of eternity and he was there with Moses, and he was there with John, and he saw the self-same vision that Moses saw. Now, that's what sets this teaching apart. Um, and, you know, we say this, and people think that we're arrogant and inflated in our minds. But that's how Dr. Kinley was able to explain the purpose of Yahweh in such a way that is um, completely revolutionary. Now, read on. See, I was sent in, the, in this closing of this age, just like Noah was Lay sent down. in the closing of the antediluvian. You understand? No. Now, just like I, 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 sorry, um, I, I want you to try to, uh, this is the statement, and you know, was, I don't know, it was three or four years ago when I first re remember reading this, I probably had read it before. Um, we know Dr. Kinley said this, and uh, I'm going to come back to all of this on the ages and dispensations chart, but he says, I was sent in the closing of this age. So that is this present kingdom age of grace that we are living in. That age opened on the day of Pentecost, and we're now in the closing of it. And I don't know if I'll get to this in detail, but Dr. Kinley actually declared that 1960 was the end of this age. This age actually is over. And he explained that we are now in a probationary period. Um, right. Just like Noah, and he's saying here, just like Noah. And then, you know, I hadn't thought about this until, like I say, it just struck me a while back. But when he says, just like Noah, there's a lot more to that statement than I necessarily appreciated. And it's some of that is which I'm, I'm hoping to get across. And again, I had mentioned the um, teachings that we get from the West Coast nowadays. And 
Um, it's just my view, you know, if we can understand the purpose of Yahweh according to the pattern, the way Dr. Kinley taught it, then, uh, and have a revel, we have, you know, it's not just repeating what Dr. Kinley said, it's understanding how the law and the prophets witness to it. And it's having a revelation of the reality of Yahweh's purpose. Then that just, um, that just shines the light and that just reveals all of the errors and mistakes and deceptions and downright lies that exist in the world. Now, um, uh, hopefully we'll get back to that a little bit more, but see, he was sent in the closing of this age, just like Noah was sent in the closing of the antediluvian. Noah was, had 120 years to prepare the ark and he, uh, Yahweh had said, the end of all flesh has come before me. So there was a 120-year period between Yahweh commissioning Noah to build the ark and the flood, which ended the antediluvian age. So that 120 years constitutes a probationary period. It constitutes a transitionary period. And so Dr. Kenley declares that the end had of all flesh had come before Yahweh and that in 1960, and that we are in a probationary period. Okay, read on. You understand, and just like Messiah was sent there in the closing of that one. Now, see, it's the same with Yahshua the Messiah. Now, uh, you know, you'll read in, in Genesis, I'm not gonna get it, I think it was the 15th chapter, where Yahweh Elohim and two angels came and visited um, Abraham and had dinner with him. So he was there with um, Abraham. You read that is Yahweh Elohim who told Noah that the, uh, that the flood was coming and to prepare an ark. So he was there with Noah. And we read that um, Adam and Eve, uh, you know, they hear, heard the sound of Yahweh Elohim walking in the garden, and they hid after they had transgressed um, the commandment. So he was there. There has never been a time when he hasn't been present. Um, and so with Yahshua the Messiah, um, he, and he was there with Moses as Joshua the son of Nun. But you see, it wasn't, he wasn't identified to the world. Uh, we didn't know who he was um with abraham and joshua we didn't know who he was now there's a teaching about five fullnesses that's been propagated but the only use of the word fullness in the bible pertains to yahshua the messiah and so this is yahweh elohim manifest as a man and he's coming in at the close of the post diluvian age just like uh, he sent Noah in at the end of the antediluvian age, and just like he sent Dr. Kinley in at the end of this present cage, he came in himself as a man, born of a woman, to close out that um, post-diluvian age. So start that again with, and just like the Messiah, please. And just like the Messiah was sent there in the closing of that one, then the age that's closing now, I was sent, see? Now here's my job. Now here's my job. And I want you to understand it. My job is not disagreeing with what Moses and them have said back here. You see? What Messiah and them have done, you understand? And what John on the Isle of Patmos is done, see, disagreeing with them. So you see, he was he saw the same vision Moses saw, he saw the same vision John saw, and he was not going to come in and disagree with anything that was in the law and the prophets, because Isaiah 8 and 20 is a declaration of how Yahweh uh, is operating his purpose. And, um, and, you know, I know uh, we're all aware of this, and, and it's been mentioned many times, but I just want you to bear in mind just the significance of this, is Doc uh, 
everything he taught, while it's revolutionary to the world and it's not what you would think if you read the Bible on your own, every single thing we teach is consistent with and witness to in the law and in the prophets. And John is talking about seeing seven angels and seven spirits and seven candlesticks and seven churches. And see, all that is witness to in the law and in the prophets. Um, go ahead. Now, this is what my job is. My job is taking all that Moses and John and everybody else in between there said and done and proving it was so. Okay. Now, that's what, now that's what, his, what his job was. And, and see, we all, uh, I mean, that is one of the revolutionary things uh, ab about this, this teaching. Um, and you understand that's what, that's what he's showing us. Come on. On this Moses chart. See what Moses saw and what John saw telling us what it was and proving that it is, is so. Now, um, Let's see, where did that go? So go ahead and read this one. It's just another uh, iteration. Uh, I won't interrupt you here, but um, just so you, and there's other places in the transcripts and you can uh, I'll be happy to tell you where these transcripts are. And I didn't write the page down here, so I can dig that up. But see, we're just trying to understand for ourselves the things that were shared with us by the founder. We're not saying, oh, we worship Dr. Kinley. We believe um, it just because he said it. He taught us these things. And it's through an understanding of the law and the prophets, which comes by the Holy Spirit, that we come to the same understanding that he had. And we can come to the same understanding that the Messiah had. Uh, go ahead, read this, please, Reba. I saw the self-same vision that John saw on the Isle of Patmos, and I come to impart it to you in the closing of this dispensation and in the closing of this age. And it's up to you whether you want to believe or not. And the things that I say to you, I know good and well that theologians are not going to believe me any more so than the Sanhedrin Council believed in the Messiah and the Gospels in those days. But nevertheless, it is true. Okay. <clears throat> I heard a voice from heaven. Uh, that's the name of the transcript. Okay, so now... Uh, in some recent classes, we've had people run... Um, that same lecture where the dispensations and ages were taught, uh, talked about, uh, this speaker ran these circles. And so this circles show you um, the same thing. It shows you the operation of Yahweh's purpose. Coming out of um, eternity into the chaosis of the Genesis, then we have... Um, both the antediluvian and the post-diluvian age compressed into this circle here. Now, Yahshua the Messiah, he was born in the at the end of the post-diluvian age, and he uh, closed out that post-diluvian age. He uh, fulfilled the law and the prophets, and uh, that's what's shown here. And then his death, burial, ascension, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit inaugurated this present uh, age that we're in. Now, uh, we're, this is showing that mystery of iniquity, which has operated all the way down through, which we're going to uh, try to review briefly. Um, and then uh, we're right down here, as it were, oops, at the end of this present kingdom age. And if you could bear in mind the ages and dispensations chart. And I just wanna say, um, you know, all these charts and, uh, you know, it says a picture's worth a thousand words and all these facts and all these principles. Um, 
it's not a matter of just memorizing them. It's just slowly over time as we understand one and then we understand another and we understand it, how it fits together, we're building a tabernacle, as it were, of understanding in our hearts and in our minds. And in this tabernacle, you had different vessels and those vessels had particular places and they had particular functions. And as we come to understand the gospel and as we come to understand these principles and how they interrelate, you see, that is the presence of Yahshua forming in our understanding. Uh, and that is a, a tabernacle as it were. Now, um, what I'd like to do, uh, and I know this is a lot, but again, please just try to stay with me. Um, any questions, inconsistencies, things you disagree with, uh, whatever it is, please just write it down and don't um, and stay with me as we go through this. And then um, we'll be more than happy to discuss any of this uh, after class or uh, Bob has said we could always have subsequent classes to review certain aspects of it. Now, uh, several classes recently, and I'm not going to um, just spend much time on it, but it talks about <clears throat> this is, uh, believe it or not, and as I know, it's, uh, th th this is a picture of something that can't be pictured. This actually is called the Theosophy Plate in the 40 Plate Chart. And this is a representation of Yahweh, the all in all and showing that he is intelligence, he is wisdom. And see how these hearts are covered by um, this cloudy uh, depiction. See, it's so there, there are no hearts that you can see. There's no division in Yahweh. He is one, he's the all in all. But he is intelligence, wisdom, and knowledge, beauty, love, justice, foundation, power, and strength without descriptive, describable, or discernible shape and form. He inhabits eternity. He's incomprehensible. He's inscrutable. He's indiscernible. He uh, inhabits the kingdom. See, and this is the kingdom that uh, was prepared for you before the foundation of the world, before Yahweh's creative motion. Um, and another way of thinking about all of this is this is Yahweh in his pure spirit state represents a single unified principle. He is the, and this is from the textbook, inscrutable and incomprehensible principle singular within which, excuse me? No, I just said right, sorry. Okay, it, within which is um, those attributes and the kingdom and the source and substance and everything else, it's all there in an incomprehensible and inscrutable state. And um, in recent transcripts, Doc had used the term ex nihilo, uh, which means it comes from the Latin phrase that the theologians use, creation from nothing. Uh, ex nihilo means from nothing. And he said, because Yahweh is inscrutable and comprehensible, it appears that it comes from nothing, but really everything lives, moves, and has its being within Yahweh, pure spirit. But Yahweh had to do something about the fact that he was incomprehensible and inscrutable in that state. Hence, he takes on shape and form in part and, and this is still not physical, this is still not visible physically, but he takes on this incorporeal, super incorporeal shape and form of Yahweh Elohim um, that we see up there in the Moses chart, which the moderator talks about, and which you now understand his name to be Yahshua. This is the son of Yahweh. This is Yahshua. Now, um, I... I so, so he shows Moses the six days of, of creation. And I don't want to labor this because I just don't have the time. But you see, in the first day, um, there's, he separates light from darkness. And he calls the light day, and he calls the darkness night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So he establishes two principles of day, uh, the light is day, and the evening and the morning constituted a day. And so you'll find out, um, well, that, uh, see, I don't, 
Okay. And then the second day, he separates the waters above from the waters beneath. The third day, the dry land appears, and then the seed of vegetation comes forth. And that's a double operation. The fourth day, he establishes uh, the sun for a light by day, the moon and the stars for a light by night. Uh, he creates the light back here in the first day, but there's no visible source uh, on the, until the fourth day when you have the sun for a light by day, the moon, ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night and um, establishes the seasons and everything else. The fifth day you have spirit animation um, and that's actually the first uh, moving creatures that you have on the earth. And then the sixth day is another double operation where he forms the man and then the man goes into a deep sleep and he forms the woman. Now, you can take these days and see, as we show through Moses uh, with that vision, we talked about a day with Yahweh is as a thousand years. So this first day would correlate with the Adamic dispensation. And you see, you read in John where it says in, in him, in the word, in Yahshua was light and the light was the life of men. So in the Adamic, uh, the per, you know, uh, dispensation, you have Adam being given life, or you have light uh, manifest. And then you had the waters above separated from the waters beneath. And with Noah and the flood, you have the flood coming down and the, the firmament uh, being broken. And you have water coming back down from the sky. So you have... Uh, the vision of the waters here, and then you have a joining of the waters uh, with Noah, and that's second dispensation. Now, the third dispensation is Abraham and Melchizedek and the seed of Abraham and the promise to his seed. And so you have um, the, the seed of vegetation, which was uh, in the earth, and Yahweh resurrects that seed seed of vegetation. So you have the seed of vegetation resurrecting in this third day, showing us that third dispensation with uh, Abraham and the promise. Now, uh, the fourth dispensation is the mosaic or the dispensation of the law. And you read over there, uh, I forget where it is, uh, Isaiah maybe, but it says um, that Yahweh gives us the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night. So you have Yahweh establishing the, the law. Then uh, on the, the fifth day or the fifth dispensation is really uh, Yahshua coming in, fulfilling the law and the prophets, which he did in the post-Luvian age, and then bringing on the day of Pentecost. See, so you have man's heart and mind being animated by the spirit uh, in that a uh, fifth dispensation, which is referred to as the dispensation of grace. Then on the sixth day, you have Yahweh forming the man and Yahweh bringing forth the woman or the bride. And you see you have Yahshua and his bride, uh, Adam and Eve in the garden representing Yahshua and his bride. So that sixth dispensation, you could look at as a culmination of the bride or the assembly. And um, we're going to get all back into all of that. Um, so that, again, I decided, you know, try to go through this a few times and just uh, work with it. But you can see then that we have, um, and then the seventh day, uh, Yahweh rested from all his labors. And so we find out that there is a spiritual rest. So this... Um, one way of looking all of this, see, so now if we go back to this ages and dispensations chart, um, you see, what we find out is that Adam, actually, Adam was created in the creative age, and it was Yahweh operating through Adam that brought us out of eternity and instituted um, time, and we begin counting time uh, at the at the tr after the transgression, and so you have, uh, as it were, Adam uh, bringing us over uh, or bridging between, or or a transition period, or taking us across 
from eternity into time. So if we look at Dr. Kinley, he manifested here at the end of time. We read that his purpose was um, to come in at the end of this age. And he was manifest as a man, and he restored the preaching of the true gospel, which was lost uh, due to the, the pagan persecution and the dark ages and everything else. And really, um, in a sense, and then he declared that the age ended in 1960. So you could see that Dr. Kinley is bringing us from time through the preaching of the gospel from time back into uh, eternity. And so this next age that we're looking forward to, we should be there now in the spirit. We can see into the spirit now. And that's what the operation of the Holy Spirit does. We can see through that veil. It's, uh, it would be like that veil between the holy place and the most holy place would be here. And then when the flesh is taken out of our heart and mind, when the Holy Spirit makes that intercession for us, we can now see into this spiritual dispensation of grace, which is operating all through this present kingdom age of grace. Now, um, another way to review that same material is, um, oh, wrong way, here we go. And, you know, again, this was on the chart for a long time, and I never paid much attention to it. Oops, excuse me. Here we go. But you see, we have the Edenic transgression, and that opened up that Adamic dispensation, and it opened up that antediluvian age or the age of conscience. Now, um, the mystery of iniquity in Cain, uh, he built that treasure city, uh, the city of Enoch, and we read that by the time Yahweh appeared to Noah, the iniquity um, imagination of man's heart was evil continually. Um, I, I am hoping we can go through all this on the 40 plate chart, and I want to work with that in a little more detail. But you see, um, we have Noah coming in, and Noah was born in the antediluvian age. He was born, as it were, under the Adamic dispensation, which was... Um, you know, I'm not going to get into all the details of it here, but childbearing, that they should be saved through childbearing. There was a promise, but there was also uh, a decree that they would labor and earn bread by, a, by the, the sweat of his brow, that the woman would suffer in childbearing, and so on and so forth. Now, Noah is born into that age at the end of that age, and the iniquity had waxed very great. And the imagination of man's heart was evil continually. And in Noah, Yahweh closes out that <clears throat> antediluvian age. And he um, breaks the power of the mystery of iniquity. Uh, you know, he, 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 all the people that had given themselves over to wicked imagination were killed in the flood. And all life was in the ark with Noah that Yahweh purposed to preserve. And then they come over, and um, so it's through Noah that you have a transition from the antediluvian age to the post-diluvian age. Now, um, then uh, things run their course in the post-diluvian age for a while, and you have the Tower of Babel and the ancient city of Babylon, and you have the mystery of iniquity trying to rise up again, and Yahweh confuses the tongues, and you have the beginning of all these various uh, human governments that are still with us today. But, and then out of all of that, Abraham is called, and Yahweh gives him the Abrahamic promise. Uh, we read about the Melchizedek priesthood, which was... Uh, the order, uh, Yahshua is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, not after the order of Aaron. But then Abraham's seed go into bondage, and then Yahweh sends Moses down. So Moses is born, as it were, still under the Abrahamic promise. This is all taking place in the antediluvian age. But, and then Yahweh brings Israel out of um, Egypt, and establishes the law and the covenant with Israel, 
or the old covenant that we call the old covenant now. Now, um, the kingdom of Israel runs its course. They disobey Yahweh. They go into bondage uh, to Babylon and to Media, uh, Persia, uh, and to um, Grisha, and then eventually to Rome. And, and Israel is ruled by Rome when Yahshua, the Messiah, is born. And he comes in at the close of that uh, antediluvian, uh, post-diluvian age, and he's born uh, at the end of that uh, dispensation of the law, or that fourth dispensation. He fulfills the law, moves it out of the way, nails it all to his cross, and on the day of Pentecost, it's Yahshua who opens up that fifth dispensation, or um, the age of grace. Now, uh, when you look at the ages and dispensations chart, the way it is now, we have, see, it has two dispensations here, but it doesn't differentiate. It just says the New Testament or the New Covenant. Now, um, a dispensation, uh, let me see if I can do it this way. Um, I think I have pulled out the definition and I, you know, I'm just trying, even, even with all this time, I'm, I'm still running out of time. So um, somewhere, yeah. yeah. So this is a definition of a dispensation uh, from the dictionary, Merriam-Webster dictionary. Um, a general state or ordering of things, uh, a system of commands and promises regulating human affairs. So this is going to get back to the fact that we have spiritual dispensations and we have physical dispensations. Adam was a physical man. Noah was a physical man. Abraham was a physical man. Moses was a physical man. Um, the apostles were physical. Uh, Yahshua was, came in as a physical man. It's the only time he was born of a woman as a physical man. Um, the apostles were physical men, and Dr. Kenley was a physical man. And Yahweh is operating his purpose through men. And so that would constitute dispensations of time. Well, uh, at the same time, this entire age, we are in the spiritual dispensation. This is the age of grace, and we are in the spiritual dispensation of grace. It began at Pentecost, and it continues now. And we're delivered into the spirit um, through the preaching of the gospel and through the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, I did also go um, to the textbook and the definition that, of dispensation that's in the textbook is divinely appointed order or system and also um, Yahweh Elohim and, and this is primarily what I'm focusing on in, in the context of revelation and in the context of Yahweh's purpose, trying to understand the role that Dr. Kinley claimed to have in the operation of Yahweh's purpose, and also showing how some of the claims that are made about fullnesses and successors who own successors because Dr. Kinley's coming back in different people, how all of that um, is contradicted by the operation of Yahweh's purpose as it's witnessed in the law and in the prophets. So uh, in the textbook for dispensation, it says Yahweh Elohim used certain individuals to begin and end a particular affair for a certain period of time effective upon the people at that time, such as, and then just as we've gone through, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and then the new covenant, and then six and seven, these are, see, as I had showed you, these are talking about things that are not in time, and they are not physical. These are spiritual dispensations. So the question that came up in my mind, and the thing that will answer some of the, these questions that I've brought up, is coming to understand uh, certain operations uh, of Yahweh in the context of a dispensation in time, the operation of Yahweh actually through 
people through a specific man at a specific time. So if you could please try to bear that in mind. Here, let me get our chart back up here. Okay, so I know this is a lot. I, I hope you're still with me. Um, now, I just want to rehearse the same thing. Uh, so we've got about 40 minutes left. I hope, um, hope you're not worn out. So um, this is what we want to focus on now. It's just Yahweh operating through a specific person at a specific time. Now, uh, if you would go back to Revelation 1 and 20 for me and read that again. Uh, there's one other thing I want to throw into the mix here uh, that I should do at this point. Okay, Revelation 1 and 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven assemblies and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven assemblies. Okay, now, um, you know, we read, uh, we've worked with this a lot. It's, it, you know, the, the Revelation 12, 1 and 2, how uh, John sees a woman clothed in the sun, how heaven is opened and he sees a woman clothed in the sun. And um, I, this is all <clears throat> in the book, and I have the scriptures. I don't think, I, I don't want to try to go through all this now because then I'll for sure run out of time uh, and maybe if we're lucky we'll even have time for a question or two at the end uh, if I'm optimistic about this but you know there, there are certain things we need to bear in mind with Revelation which is um, you know when John sees that woman clothed in the sun and there is a transcript I could pull after class if, if, uh, if anyone is interested. I don't think I would need to get into, I don't have time to get into it now, but it's on the 40 play chart where you see Adam and Eve in the garden in peace and harmony. Adam said, you know, she's bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. It reads in the book, they should be one flesh. So even though they're manifested as two individuals, um, they're still unified in their hearts and in their minds, they're unified by love. And Dr. Kinley put on the chart, see Yahshua and his bride. Now, if you took that literally, Yahshua wasn't married. We are there, I mean, there's theories and novels in the world, but we don't have, Yahshua didn't have a woman that he married and had physical children, Bri. So what do you mean, Yahshua and his bride? And uh, we come to find out, and I'll pull some of these scriptures if it fits and if we need to and if we have time, but um, I know it's in Ephesians. I think it's the fifth chapter where Paul is talking about a man and a woman and woman, husbands love your wives and wives love your husbands. And then he goes, but I speak of a great mystery for I speak of Yahshua and the church. So we find out that in the language of the visionary language of Yahweh's purpose and the visionary language of the book of Revelation and of the law and the prophets, the woman or the bride is synonymous with the church or the assembly. Now the world thinks in terms of a church being a physical building where you go and a priest performs some sort of a ritual or a service or gives a lecture or a sermon. But you see the church, the bride, the woman are all the same. And so what we find operating through Yahweh's purpose is he's operating with types and shadows. So you see, it's very clearly portrayed on the chart here where you're the man and the woman is typical of Yahshua and the church or the bride or the assembly. Now, um, we all together uh, make up that bride or the assembly, and uh, we'll get into that hopefully in a little more detail. Um, but so try another thing to try to bear in mind is, so when you're looking at Eve, you see a woman, but she represents the church or the bride of Yahshua or the woman. 
When you read Revelation 12, a woman clothed in the sun, she represents the church. Well, how many churches are there? Oh, well, in Revelation, it says there were seven churches. But you see, uh, and I think actually I, I will get this. It's another transcript that I'll take the time to work through. Um, where is it? Uh, yeah. So this is the 144,000 and an innumerable company of angels transcript. It's on pages 16 to 18. And um, I'm going to try to work through this one because I don't want to read all of this. But um, the, Dr. Kenley is working with Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Uh, why don't we get that and just read? Um, I'll tell you what verse. Uh, is it 12? Um, you have not come to the mount that might be touched. Maybe that you have come. Yeah, verse 18. Hebrews 12, verse 18. For ye have not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire nor in the blackness and darkness and tempest. Okay, and skip to 22, of... I'm sorry. Um, but you see that, that's Mount Sinai and the, the cloud on there, it's a burning inferno and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words. He's saying, you, you haven't come to Mount Sinai. We're not back there with Moses. We're over here in the spirit with John. But now read verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living Elohim, the heavenly Jerusalem, now the he an Go ahead. And to an innumerable company of angels. So, see, uh, and and so that's what Dr. Kinley is working with here in this transcript. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'll just ask you to skip through. If somebody could read this this transcript here. Um, Paul right. is talking about when you become a recipient of the Holy Spirit, then you have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay, You've come so um, I, that's a point, see, to bear in, in mind. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in here, but I, I just wanted to point out that, um, you know, when you talk about heavenly Jerusalem, um, See, that Eve, oh, where'd my charts go? Sorry, there we go. So see, Eve represents that she's a woman, she's Adam's bride, but she also represents the church. And there's only one church, the General Assembly, um, the, the bride of Yahshua, which is heavenly Jerusalem. And so you have here Adam and his bride, but remember in Revelation, uh, it said, um, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. And in the types and in the shadows, if you can substitute a woman with a church, then you see in this first dispensation or in this Adamic dispensation, you have Adam. He's the head of the woman. He's that angel. And Eve represents that um bride or that assembly and uh adam named eve uh because her name means the mother of all living and so within eve is the entire human race so you have adam as the head and you have the woman or the bride or the assembly being as it were um humanity now um we understand there's a mystery of iniquity and its origin in um, these uh, disobedient angels that were cast out of heaven, immersed in ethereal darkness, and have been operating in the earth plane through humanity down through um, the ages and dispensations of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's actually the presence of Satan and his appearing to Eve. Uh, Eve is deceived, they transgress the commandment, and um, 
brings us out of the garden, out of eternity, out of this Edenic dispensation, so to speak, down into the earth, into the Adamic dispensation, where Yahweh says, Does that, where death, it's a, it's a covenant of death in that we are all born and we all die um, after the physical. And so you have Adam and Eve representing as it were that first candlestick um i hope you can see that now um we come over and uh it, it's in genesis uh third chapter um we're, we're 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 now in the last 28 minutes so we're coming down the home stretch here but uh i want you to just read this and and keep this in mind and it's where um we don't have time to get it all, but uh, it's Yahweh. See, after they transgressed, they hid from Yahweh. And you actually had a day of judgment here where Yahweh speaks to Adam, Eve, and Lucifer and um, casts Adam out of the garden and passes judgment on them. And uh, But what I want to get, uh, because it'll help us if we... Um, it's verse 15, and this is Yahweh talking to the serpent, which we understand represents the mystery of iniquity. And, you know, we've had classes, and we have YouTube now with all these classes recorded, and all of these things have been gone into detail many times, and they'll be gone into detail again. Right now, I'm just trying to bring these things to our remembrance so we can hold them in our minds as we come to an understanding operation of Yahweh's purpose. So read verse 15, please, in the um, Bible. Genesis 3:15, right, uh, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, there's a lot going on here, and ultimately this is a prophecy of the Messiah, who is that seed of the woman come down through the 63 generations, as it were, and um, who uh, crushes the mystery of iniquity on the cross. And we talk about how um, Yahshua died on the cross, went into the tomb, and the mystery of iniquity hasn't seen him yet. But this war, this struggle, this operation of the two mysteries, see, if, and, and, and if you think about it, the seed of the woman, uh, from a natural standpoint, we would think of that as the entire human race, because that all human beings, good and bad, come from Eve. But what we find out is this mystery of iniquity also operates through uh, the flesh, behind that veil of the flesh. It, it also, also inhabits and influences and corrupts and perverts uh, the hearts and minds of man. When we get down to Noah, we see that it's manifested in the fact that the man's heart was evil. The imagination of man's heart was evil continually. So, see, this seed of the serpent represents those individuals through whom the mystery of iniquity is operating. And this seed of the woman represents those individuals through whom the mystery of righteousness is operating. And you have both mysteries operating down through the ages and dispensations of time. So um, we see that uh, they're cast out into the garden and uh, Cain murders Abel, and that's showing you that seed of the serpent or that mystery of iniquity. It's showing you he's a liar and a murderer from the beginning, which Yahshua picks up. And this is going to help us understand human history when we realize that Yahweh has decreed these two spirits, these two mysteries, are operating. So um, they descend into the earth and Cain kills Abel and he eventually goes on and builds up the city of Enoch. And Doc says here, see Vatican City. And you see this mystery of iniquity, its purpose is to show forth the purpose of Yahweh. So we don't have a lot, uh, we, we don't have hardly any information about what was going on here. Uh, but we see we have Cain and his wife and his son Enoch portrayed here. And uh, we understand through Dr. Kenley and through looking at the Vatican, how Yahweh established 
uh, uh, the mystery of iniquity uh, at the auspices of Yahweh established uh, a city that ruled the world here. And so that, made that, that imagination of man's heart being evil continually is a, shows you that this mystery of iniquity ruled the world. And it was only those few individuals, that seed of the woman, and you can take the lineage from uh, Abel is killed and Seth is born, and then it comes down eventually to Noah. And see, so Noah finds grace in the eyesight of Yahweh. And Yahweh uh, comes to Noah and talks to Noah and tells Noah to prepare this ark. So as we said, um, we have the antediluvian age uh, beginning with the transgression and Adam and Eve are cast out into the garden. We have that Adamic dispensation. We have the age of conscience that begins there. And we have the conscience uh, immersed in wickedness for most of the people, and Yahweh cuts that off and kills all the people that were worshiping that mystery of iniquity, all the people that were ruled, as it were, by that city. So, um, and then he brings that to an end, and those people are killed. But that spirit, see, you can't drown a spirit. So that same spirit that came out of heaven, see, it comes across. But then Yahweh delivers Noah and his family, just eight in the ark. And just as, see, Eve was the mother of all living, and Adam was her husband, and that's showing you, as it were, that first dispensation, that first candlestick, that uh, first angel of Adam, and that first uh, church or assembly or bride, Eve. Now you have Noah and the ark. Now, he did have a wife, and he did have children. But, see, Eve was the mother of all living. And you had all living, all life that was preserved, all, all breathing creatures were preserved in the ark. So you have Noah and the ark coming across, and through Noah, Yahweh closes out that antediluvian age and opens up that post-diluvian age. Now, eventually, um, and then he makes a Noah a covenant with Noah. See, there was a promise to Abraham. There was a, uh, that they would be delivered through childbearing, and Paul picks that up. There's a promise to Noah and a commandment, replenish the earth, and I won't destroy the world anymore by um, water. So you have a covenant, and so you have a Noahic promise. You have the Noahic dispensation that we see on the chart. Now, um, remember that mystery of iniquity came across. So what do you have? You have... Satan getting back to business, and he's trying to raise up his uh, city to rule the world again. And so you find him uh, discounting the promise, ignoring the covenant, and trying to build that tower of Babel. And Yahweh comes down and uh, confuses their tongue and nips it in the bud, as it were. And um, what you have from there is it says mankind is dispersed or scattered across the face of the earth. And you have the beginning of these human governments. And the first government that we have record of that I, you know, and it's sketchy, is you had Nimrod here and you have him just like Cain built that uh, dynasty, that city back there in the Antediluvian age. You wind up uh, with ancient Babylon and Nimrod, and you have the beginnings of human history uh, in this post-Diluvian age. And you say, really, um, you had those governments, and, and you had uh, the pop people scattered at different languages, and so you have a confusion of tongues. Back here, there was only one tongue. So Yahweh calls Abraham, and it's not, this is a downward chart, but uh, I'm working it a little bit differently. But see, he called Abraham, um, out of the Ur of Chaldees, and eventually Abraham is called up into Canaan's land. And Yahweh promises Abraham that he'll have a son. So you have an Abrahamic promise. You have a covenant, and you have the seed. Um, see, Abraham had a, his beloved wife, Sarah. He had other children, but in Isaac thy seed shall be called. In Sarah's child shall thy seed be called. So you have Yahweh establishing. Uh, this is where the, the Hebrew people come from, is, is through Isaac and Jacob. 
And so Yahweh shows Abraham that those children are going to go down in a bondage. So another great civilization that arises uh, after in this in this post diluvian age after the fall is um, Egypt. And we go over this all the time, and I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. But you see, Yahweh calls Moses. Moses comes down here. He delivers the children of Israel out of Egypt and establishes the, the old covenant or the law with the children of Israel. And that's that fourth dispensation. And he sets up Moses as the angel, as it were. Moses is the leader. Moses is the one who calls them out. And um, Israel is his uh, is the bride, and you know there's just a lot of, to this, and I've I've got to really move now. But you understand, you can see there Moses and physical Israel. Now they eventually they get up here and they have a kingdom, and they they are the greatest kingdom in the world for a while. But then Solomon, in his latter days, he disobeyed Yahweh, he worshipped idols, and um, then when Solomon dies, what happens? Um, the, the tribes split. First, first Israel uh, goes off and they build two golden calves and establish their own religion. And then Yahweh uh, uh, brings in the Assyrians and they go into captivity to the Assyrians. And then uh, just a few years later, that Israel, uh, the tribe of um, uh, Benjamin and Judah, along with the, uh, uh, the Levitical priesthood, they stayed in Jerusalem, but eventually, you see, they disobey Yahweh, and Yahweh sets up Babylon, and they go into captivity in Babylon. And to make a long story short, um, this plate here, this history plate, this covers the period of time from the cap first captivity of Israel down to the Messiah. And it shows Israel going into these successive captivities. And then, as we mentioned, they were in captivity to Rome. They were, uh, Jerusalem was ruled by Rome at the time of the Messiah. So now the Messiah, he's born in, under the law, the dispensation of the law, or the Mosaic dispensation. He's born at the close of the post diluvian age. And he, uh, I just realized I'm talking loudly. I hope my microphone hasn't been too tinny. Um, I'll try to calm down. <laughs> You're good, Greg. Okay, thank you. Um, so Yahshua comes in and he closes out that post diluvian age. And there's a transitionary period uh, of his life in one sense, but certainly he goes into his ministry as 30, just as the high priest went into his ministry at 30. And for three and a half years, he fulfills, he fulfills the entire old covenant. And see, as we have on that other chart, he nails it to his cross. And I just have, don't time, you know, we don't have time to go through all these different things here, but um, he is crucified. Here we go. And, you know, we, we, the, the, the Passover lamb was crucified. Adam died. Uh, Noah went through a death, a burial in the ark and a resurrection. Children of Israel went through a death, a burial and a resurrection. Now here, Yahshua fulfilling all of that and a million things. He goes through a death, a burial, a resurrection and ascension. And he is that fifth angel in the sense that he just showed up as a man. Now, it was Yahshua working through Moses. It was Yahshua working with Abraham. It was Yahshua working through Noah. It was Yahshua working with Adam. It was Yahshua doing it all the way down through, you see. But here he shows up as a man, and that would put him as the fifth angel. And he comes to physical Israel, but on the day of Pentecost, See, they are converted, and the, you have the 11 apostles, and then Paul is added in as that 12th apostle. And so now you have Yahshua and his bride being spiritual Israel. But you see, when we talk about dispensations of time, Yahshua wasn't around in the flesh for very long, and he inaugurated this present kingdom age of grace. And the Holy Spirit has been operating by grace all through this, this complete age. But in the first seven years, he was only manifesting, he was only preaching through physical Jews. And see, that's shown 
on that uh, covenants chart, um, which, which I'll go back to if I have to. But so something happens. And Paul is, uh, 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 he's a Jew. He was a eunuch, so he couldn't uh, attend the congregation. And he's very zealous. And there's a persecution. The, the scribes and the Pharisees hated Yahshua. They put him on the cross in fulfillment of the scriptures, though they didn't know it. And then they're trying, they threaten Peter uh, and, and, and John not to preach in the name Yahshua. And then Paul is going around with letters of authority, persecuting. Actually, they had Stephen Stone. See, Paul is standing around here. Uh, holding the cloak of them that stoned Stephen. And um, Yahweh, so, so you have this persecution of the Jews. It's only Jews at this point. And that causes them to be scattered out into Asia Minor. And that's where these assemblies, there's a transcript where Doc talks about, well, where did the church at Rome come from? Well, Cornelius and his band, they were Romans, and they went back to Rome, and they established that church, and Paul went to Rome and taught them, and he wrote the Epistle of Romans, and that's how you get these various churches that you're reading about in Revelation. You see, they're uh, showing you um, this operation of Yahweh in this age, so that you could look, and it's predicted here. I better go back and get it. Um, I mean, this is actually what gave me the idea, is uh, far as the fifth and sixth dispensation, not that it's the same dispensation of grace. It's the same age of grace. But this was Jews only for seven years. And then if you look at a dispensation being an administration or an operation with physical people according to physical commandments and promises, um, when Peter goes to Cornelius's house, you see, and the Gentiles receive the Holy Spirit, that's a completely different operation. And then Yahweh had set up the Jews. The Jews were the ones who understood the witnesses, understood the law and the prophets. And so they um, are the ones who were the deans and uh, the preachers of the assemblies. And so that gospel is preached to um, the Gentiles. And that's that uh, Gentiles Pentecost, the conversion of the Gentiles. And then Saul, and I've got the scriptures, we don't have time, but Saul, the only place you find the word dispensation in the Bible is in several references that Paul makes, where he says that he was given a dispensation of grace, that a dispensation of the gospel was committed to him. Now, it's the same gospel, Peter, James, and John, and see, Paul is grafted in as the 12th apostle, and Paul was a Jew, and Paul was knowledgeable, but Yahweh sets Paul up, and it's in the book, and it's in the transcripts, as the apostle to the Gentiles. So in that limited sense, Paul being a physical man and Gentiles being physical people, you can look at Paul as being that sixth angel and uh, the Gentiles being, as it were, uh, that assembly. So you have the spiritual Jews and Jews only, and then you have um, the Gentiles coming in as spiritual Gentiles, for lack of a better word. They're grafted in. It's one body. It's one assembly. It's Jerusalem above. It's the same dispensation of grace. It's the same present kingdom age of grace. But you see, it's a different operation. And then what happens is that um, the pagans, the Romans, pick up on this persecution business and they drive the gospel underground. They, um, they kill James and, and, and so on and so forth. And then uh, eventually, what happens? You have, um, you know, Paul dies in the 60s AD sometime. Peter dies. All the apostles die. John is preserved on the Isle of Patmos to bear witness that we were reading in Revelation. But then what happens is Constantine, three or 400 AD, and remember that figure, pagan and papal Rome, that's still running on down through the time. We're still got human governments. We still got the mystery of iniquity ruling the world. 
and ruling the hearts and minds of man if you have not been liberated by the Spirit. And then you have the Holy Roman Empire. You have the Catholic Church established. They restore carnal ordinances, and they establish the papacy and the Vatican and the Roman Catholic Church. And they're the ones who preserved the scriptures through the Dark Ages, and they're the ones who preserved a lot of the learning through the Dark Ages. And they essentially rule the world. And you have Mystery Babylon, and this is referred in Revelations, which includes all of the organized religions. And um, the Catholics basically reiterate the carnal ordinances and the commandments and the priesthood and the things that were contained in the law to the Jews. So they restore those carnal ordinances. They restore a physical priesthood. They restore garments of beauty and glory. And then the Protestants take exception to some of the excesses, but they teach the same doctrine, Trinity, you know, baptism, uh, communion or mass, and so on and so forth. The Jew, uh, Jewish religion, they're still practicing carnal ordinances. You have the other religions that are practicing carnal ordinances. So the world is now still ruled by that mystery of iniquity who is practicing carnal ordinances, which is a lie. And then what happens in 1931, and we don't really have this on the chart, but Dr. Kinley um, is given a vision. And he's the only man in the world that is preaching the true gospel. You, you know, you can find, you know, that the spirit was operating the, this, the dispensation of grace was still in business all through this time from Pentecost down to 1931 and the present, but it wasn't, you, you couldn't go, you couldn't, uh, the literature we have, the true gospel, the doctrine uh, that Paul was teaching, the doctrine that Peter, James, and John were teaching, you have it referenced in the epistles, and you have uh, the book of Revelation, but the religions of the world, they teach carnal ordinances. They don't teach salvation by grace through faith and not of, your, that not of yourself, it's a gift. And so it's Yahweh through Dr. Kinley, uh, who he, he was sent in and he was born at the end of this present kingdom age. He was born um, in that dispensation where the, the gospel was available to both the Jew, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Jew and the Gentile. See, but it, would, it was underground. It wasn't being preached. And so he restores that true gospel. And um, now we're looking for this to be manifest eventually when we pass out of time into the next age, which is back in the realm of eternity and in the realm of immortal glorification. But you see, through the preaching of the gospel, all the way down through this present kingdom age of grace, we can be at rest now. We can be in the Sabbath now. We can be uh, in heaven spiritually. We are in heaven. See, the new covenant is written in the heart and mind. And that puts us into New Jerusalem, or that puts us into the kingdom of heaven. And in every disp dispensation, and in this sense, See, we can look at Dr. Kinley as being the seventh angel, and Yahweh has now restored the gospel. And this idea that you're going to have an eighth one come in, they see, or, or sometimes people want to skip Paul, make Dr. Kinley number six, and make uh, Dr. Harris number seven. See, if you get Dr. Kinley as number seven, there is no eighth angel. His word is final, and you can't have someone come in and say the law and the prophets aren't valid anymore, and so on and so forth. So in every dispensation, once the truth is established, once Yahweh lights that candlestick, once Yahweh establishes that bride, that church, that assembly, then what do you have? Is you have that mystery of iniquity come in and say, no, you won't surely die. You have the opposition. And so we've got to see an opposition come in. Now, we haven't done too bad. We've actually, it, it was a rush job. So I, I do have this one drawing, and I do want to try to give it to you. Um, if I can find it, I think I can. Yeah, here we go. So I just want to review what we've discussed. Um, I realize this is taking things in a way that um, 
is a little different than what we have on some of our charts. I know this is an eye, eye chart, but um, anyone that wants this, it's not quite finished, but at some point, um, this, I just wanted to use this to summarize you see, so when John is seeing those seven churches, it's not just the seven churches that are in Asia. That's the type in the shadow. But Jerusalem is just one assembly. And so those seven churches make up the one assembly. And we read about how when Yahshua resurrected from the dead, many of the sons who slept in the dust of the earth rose on up and went on in Jerusalem. And Doc has that woman clothed in the sun painted there. Uh, when they resurrect and painted there at Pentecost. And there's a transcript, which I have, where he says, uh, those many of the sons who rose, resurrected after Yahshua's resurrection, that was his bride. So you see Adam and all of them down in the Antediluvian age who died in the faith, who had the oil in their lamps. You see, they resurrected with Yahshua. Noah and all those with him down through that... Um, and to the post diluvian age, Abraham and them, Job and all the prophets and all them, Moses. Um, see, they all died in the faith, not having received the promises, and they all resurrected in Yahshua. So we have Adam and his bride. That's the first uh, angel or the first church or the first candlestick. We have Noah and the ark. That's the second angel or the second candlestick or the second flame or the second spirit. Uh, operating. And uh, then we have Abraham and the seed of Abraham and the promise. You see, we have that third angel. And then we have Moses and the law and the fourth angel. And if you think about it, see that candlestick sits on the base of that fourth branch. And the first three branches come off of it. And the way we find out about Adam, Noah, and Abraham is through the law and the things that are written in Moses. And see, the law, the prophets, and the fulfillment, they all take place in that post-Diluvian age, and they all take place within, under the dispensation of the law. The law is under the law, the prophets is under the law, and uh, the fulfillment is under the law. And you need a tripod, you need three legs in order to have a firm foundation. And now Yahshua comes in and the operation of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and spiritual Israel, see, we could look at that. That's the fifth angel and that's the fifth church and that's the fifth um, assembly. And uh, you have spiritual Israel. You have those individuals that uh, the physical Jews that were baptized under John and that received the Holy Spirit on and after the day of Pentecost. And then you have Saul set up as the apostle to the Gentiles. You have Peter preaching to Cornelius. And uh, you have John on the island of, of Patmos giving us the book of Revelation. You have Saul set up as the apostle to the Gentiles and traveling to all, uh, all across Asia Minor and sending his letters across to Asia Minor. And see, if you count Paul as the sixth, that just leaves you the seventh. And Dr. Kinley, and, and I remember Mitch talking a lot about how it's just a remnant now. They're, we're just gleaning of the field. There are just few people that will receive the gospel and be quickened by the gospel and receive the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the gospel. And you see, that's Dr. Kinley is that seventh angel. And in that sense, that's that seventh dispensation. And as we're grafted in, to the body of Yahshua. See, we were part of that heavenly Jerusalem. See, we're, we become part of that bride, just like all those that were down through. And then that's that general assembly, and that's that innumerable company of angels, and that's the spirits of men, just men made perfect. See, and we're all grafted in. And folks, you just don't have an eighth branch of the lampstand in the book. And so you do not have anyone with the authority to contradict, overcome, change, or, uh, you know, uh, devalue or whatever you want to call it, the teachings of our founder. It's one o'clock. We're done. Um, I thank you so much for this time. Please, uh, any questions, uh, be happy to talk about it. I hope this made some sense. It was a lot, but you see, it really is simple. He's just 
overturning and overturning and overturning and overturning and overturning and overturning and overturning. And with every angel, you had uh, an opposition. With every establishment of righteousness, with every man, this is the seed of the woman coming on down through the seed of righteousness. You have that seed of iniquity rising up and manifesting. And it's not bad. It's actually part of Yahweh's purpose. And it, is, it helps us to identify the true. And it shows us the contrast and the distinction and really magnifies Yahweh operating his spirit down through these dispensations, as it were, of time. Back to you. Thank you, Dr. Greg Prestis. And at this time, we will end class with the doxology. Uh, before we say that, I'd like to thank everyone that joined us on Zoom and to please keep your mics muted until the recording has stopped. Our doxology is taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him who alone is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless in the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever, let the class say, hallelujah. 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 hallelujah.